Here, in instead of physics, we work with sodium. This alkali metal is highly reactive. It can burn in air or explode when exposed to water. Nevertheless, other excellent properties of sodium make it too good not to use it for science. Today, I'm going to explain why physicists love sodium and use it in the world's biggest geodynamo experiments and nuclear reactors. To make this story more interesting, I'll start with many practical examples, like explosions in water and electromagnetic levitation. Sodium is low density and very soft when compared to other metals. To get a sample of our experiments, we simply cut it by a knife. As you can see, sodium is stored in oil, so to avoid any exposure to air or moisture. If we remove protective oil, sodium starts to oxidize even in room temperature. In higher temperatures, around 500 Celsius, sodium slowly burns, even in a protective argon atmosphere. So why, despite the dangers, we still use sodium? First of all, it's a really good electrical conductor, and it's very light. And often in science, we work to push the boundaries of what's possible, and purposely try to achieve the most extreme conditions we can. And this combination of properties makes sodium the most responsive metal to electromagnetic fields. Sometimes scientists find themselves in a situation where they need massive molten metal flows. For example, when they want to model how Earth generates its magnetic field. In such cases, sodium is the answer. It's easy to transport with a special technology called electromagnetic pumps. They combine electric and magnetic fields that causes forces in the metal, which pumps it in a unique way. Only molten metals can be moved. The high thermal conductivity makes sodium really useful in nuclear applications. In the simplest case, they work as a heat exchanger that can withstand very high power densities that would otherwise vaporize the water in a conventional heat exchanger. In previous video, we demonstrated induction heating together with induction melting and most importantly, electromagnetic levitation. Now let's do the same and instead of aluminum, let's levitate sodium. We took a small piece of sodium and put it in our levitation coil. This demonstration showcases many of the excellent properties that sodium has. It is one of the lightest metals and one of the best electrical conductors, thus it can be relatively easily held in the air by rapidly changing magnetic field. As a piece of sodium heats up, it reaches the low melting point of just under 100 degrees Celsius. We just melted a highly reactive metal in the air. But nothing happened. Well, that's because it was protected throughout the experiment with a layer of mineral oil. Now let's do another experiment where we demonstrate sodium water reaction. First, we remove the crust of the bigger piece and cut reasonable sized chunks of it. Then, and this is important, we remove the oil by washing the piece in white spirit. After that, we expose sodium to air and it starts to oxidize. During the 5 minutes in the air, a visible reaction has taken place. We even heated it close to the melting temperature, but it didn't catch fire since it forms a thick oxide layer. And air humidity, which we didn't control, is important in such experiments. Nevertheless, we shall demonstrate the violent nature of sodium and water chemical reaction. We add a little water to sodium and immediately a chemical reaction that produces hydrogen and sodium hydroxide takes place. There are no explosions we were warned about, although we see that reaction is exothermic, so produced hydrogen catches fire. Also, a chunk of sodium melts and floats in a pillow of hydrogen gas since it's lighter than water. When we add more water, reaction gets more violent. Now there are pops and bangs and all the sodium reacts with water. Now this is becoming dangerous and precautions need to take place since sodium droplets are thrown around and reaction is not controlled anymore. So please don't do it yourselves without adequate protective gear. Next up, we do this reaction when there is plentiful of water and test it with more sodium. It melts and catches fire as it happened before. The floating drop of sodium gets smaller as reaction takes place. Reaction seems stable since there are no sparks like previously. But wait for it! We finally achieved sizable explosion with just 50 grams of sodium. Let's see that again in slow motion.
And lastly, let's finish the water reduction testing with open water explosion. This time, we take a 20 gram piece and just throw it in a puddle. Sodium melts and hovers on the water by hydrogen stream before the fireworks begin. My point of view. Enjoy that first shot again in slow motion. This definitely is the most eye-pleasing video scene we have taken. Now we have seen the properties and dangers of handling sodium. Despite that, there are many experiments that use massive amount of it. There are generation 4 nuclear reactors, called fast breeder reactors. Most of them use sodium as a heat exchanger. For example, let's take a world-class breeder reactor Super Phoenix, that was built in 1980s in France and was meant to be the prototype of future nuclear plants. The heat generated by nuclear fusion happens in core, where plutonium and uranium undergoes nuclear reactions. 3000 megawatts of power have to be continuously taken away. To do that, core is fully submerged in sodium, which is circulated around the primary loop. They have to use 35,000 tons of sodium, which is circulated by four pumps with each having flow rate of 4.1 tons per second. Sodium in core inlet is 395 degrees Celsius hot and in outlet 545 degrees Celsius. So this all means that each second 16 tons of sodium is passed through and temperature rises by 150 degrees Celsius. You can calculate yourself that such flow rate of sodium with such temperature difference can carry away 3000 megawatts in dissipated heat. Super Phoenix was stopped after 10 years of running because of budget overruns, some technical problems, but also there were significant protests against it. French liked to protest so much that at one point, Swiss Green Party member shot fire rocket propelled grains at confinement building, hitting two shots. <sighs> That's why we can't have nice things. But back to the topic, molten metal transport is one of our key research areas. We have molten metal pumps, that can in a contactless way propel metal in closed loops. We research about induction pumps that create magnetic field and induce current in metal by large traveling field inductors and also use permanent magnet pumps, which use large moving magnets which in especially made channels develop impressive pressure head. In this shot, you see permanent magnet pump which can produce up to 20 bar pressure or 50 liters of flow rate of sodium. In such circuits, we test and measure characteristics like pressure and flow rate curves that characterize performance of the developed pumps, the high electrical conductivity, low density, and low melting temperature makes the sodium the best material for specific purpose. Modeling Earth's geodynamo, which explains how Earth and other planets create magnetic field, making a small-scale model of fluid dynamics of Earth, leads you to experiments that use cubic meters of sodium. For example, you can see multiple experiments around the world, which all use different approaches to prove and study self-generation of magnetic fields caused by molten sodium flow. Thanks for watching, and leave a comment what would you want to see in the next video. Dynamo experiments that experimentally proves how planetary magnetic fields are created, or how electromagnetic pumps move hot molten metals. Like and subscribe to notify YouTube algorithms that this video exists.